Welcome to the Nate KG Podcast, a show dedicated to exploring the nuances of jump rope, where I talk with jumpers of all skill levels, backgrounds, and fitness goals. On this episode, I interview Luke Boone, who is one of the most decorated jump rope athletes in the history of the sport. He's a world record holder, a 28-time world champion, and he coaches youth, adults, and other elite competitive jumpers through his company, Jump Force International. Luke has a wealth of knowledge, and I know that there are going to be several unlocks for you during this episode. We talk about so many great subjects, including how to train freestyle at a world-class level, how to count your own trip under reps correctly, how and why Luke takes notes for all things jump rope, the importance of mental benchmarks on your speed scores, and a whole lot more. This entire episode is jam-packed with awesomeness, but my favorite part is when we discuss speed training towards the second half of the episode. Luke trained his new youth jumpers to reach a 30-second speed score of 87 in only nine weeks. That's ridiculous. It blew my mind, and you absolutely do not want to miss how he achieved this incredible accomplishment. All of the show notes of this episode can be found over at natekg.com. And now, please enjoy this conversation with Luke Boone. Luke, welcome to the show. It is so awesome to have you on here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so excited to uh, share my story and, and chat with you about all of this. So thank you. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to go real deep into so many jump rope things. But I think a great place to begin would be where you are in the world and how you first picked up a jump rope. Alrighty, so I live down under, I live in Australia, um, I have my entire life and I started skipping when I was, well, as you call it, jump rope. Um, we're slowly transitioning here to, to start calling it jump rope, but I started when I was 11 years old. And it's funny, before I even knew about skipping, before I discovered it, I actually started this little skipping team on my street. Um, little did I know that I was 10 minutes away from one of the world's you know, greatest jump rope teams in the world. Um, and I started this skipping team on my street. And I, like every Tuesday, all the kids in the street would come together and we would have like trick making up day. And then we would have like afternoon performances for everyone on the street. Um, and then it would have been about a couple of months later, I saw um, on the TV, there was this like competitive team based in Cleveland, the exact same suburb that I lived in. And so... I knew about them, but I hadn't seen them in real life. And then it was a month later after that, I was at my school carnival, like a school fate thing. And this team did a demonstration. And I remember to this day, she's one of my best friends, like right now, her name was Bonnie Summers at the time. She's now married, but it was Bonnie Summers then. She ran up, she did a round off uh, backflip with her rope. And in that moment, I was like, sign me up. This is this is exactly like this is I, I just couldn't believe it. I get goosebumps now, like telling the story because I remember how I felt in that exact moment. Like it was just, yeah, everything I wanted. So, yeah, that the rest is kind of history. I, start, I literally signed up the next day and um, I just couldn't believe that something that I was already so obsessed with was actually something that was that existed that was real, you know. So but, yeah, that's how I um I found jump art. So when you were doing those, those trick with, with the club and, and the, the trick, the trick days with, with friends and stuff and the yeah. team that you had, was that, what was that just everyone kind of coming together and sharing random stuff? Were you learning from a certain source or were you just kind of making things up along the way? Like what did we that look just, like? <laughs> yeah, we were just completely making things up. Like these kids had never seen skipping either. So we, we all just really liked skipping. And I think none of the skills we really made up are, are things that I ever did when I actually started skipping. They were just, um, yeah, like just really random things like jumping forwards, jumping backwards. The only thing I remember making up that actually was something that I used in skipping was a, um, a TS and a cartwheel. T TS being a behind the back cross and a cartwheel. So that you was just did that when you were just learning on your own? Yeah, yeah. That's impressive. That is like, I feel like that's not as common for someone to pick up within the first few months of being literally self-taught. I feel like, you know, what's funny is that a lot of folks are not a lot of folks, but a few folks have used the the term self-taught this year. And I think that that's kind of interesting and funny because there's so much stuff available that regardless of if you're talking to someone one-on-one -on -one or not, 
you're still being influenced. You're still being coached indirectly by seeing those videos. Whereas what you just described was legitimately self-taught. And even then there was a, there was a piece of collaboration, an element of collaboration that was there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just found it like looking back now, it's just so strange that something like jump rope fascinated me before I discovered it was something like, you know, how most people know it now. Like, I mean, you, you walk around um, and you tell anyone here in Australia, you know, I do jump rope and they'll go, oh, that's cool. I did that at school too. They, they don't really yeah. understand what it is yeah. until they actually see it. And so <laughs> for me, I, that, I was kind of in the same boat. I didn't know it was something other than that until I actually saw it. But I, I always tried, I always enjoyed it so much that I tried doing creative things and stuff with it. But, um, but yeah. yeah then coming I, up with the TS on your own is pretty awesome. Did you, did you do any other, um, sports or were you kind of just, just jumping? Yeah. So, or just, uh, just skipping. I feel like I'm going to have to go back and forth (laughs) on this conversation. (laughs) Yeah. But we'll stick with jump rope. But, um, yeah, I think, yeah. So before I started skipping, I, I did so many different things. I, my family is actually quite big and I don't know whether you've heard of cricket. (laughs) I have. Yes, I have. I've not played it, but I've definitely heard of it. It's quite big in the cricket game my uncle is in Healy who was um probably the world's greatest wicket keeper and Elisa Healy is my cousin who is um one of the world's greatest players in the game of female cricket so um my cricket was always a really really big part of our family's culture it was what I did when I was younger but I I just couldn't really channel my creativity um through that game so yeah, I was always looking for something different uh, and I tried gymnastics and, um, really, really enjoyed that. I did diving, really, really enjoyed that. And that was when kind of, I was doing that street club skipping thing. And then all of a sudden jump rope came around and then it was just everything I loved combined into one sport. So I just kind of felt like I hit the jackpot there. <laughs> that's, that's honestly amazing. And, and the gymnastics and diving part really that makes a lot of sense to me considering how impeccably clean all of your all of your skills but especially the the tumbling skills are like that really lines up Th- those other sports um when can we like add a timeline to that like when you began them at what age yes yeah, sure. like, so i was uh you know doing the soccer and cricket thing at probably from the age of six to let's say like nine years old i played a little bit of tennis from about nine to 10. Um, and that was around the same time I was doing gymnastics and diving from about the ages of nine to 11. And then, yeah, skipping came along and obviously had to make a decision on what I wanted to continue doing. And, and that was a no brainer for me. Like, yeah, I just dropped everything else and skipping was well, jump rope was what I did. So, um, but yeah, there were a lot of things that I took from other sports that I could definitely, um, you know, take over to jump rope and, and I'm um, used to my advantage. So yeah, that I did. What were, um, what were some of those things that you learned that you use in jump rope? Uh, learning, I know from the early days with like cricket and soccer, it was learning how to be a team player and, you know, work with your team to, you know, get to the goal that you wanted and gymnastics and diving. It was definitely that training, uh, the discipline. So just, uh, training hard, working hard and, and, I guess um, always continuing to go to that next level, like always challenging myself. I never played it safe. I always wanted, um, even if I was at a certain level, I always was training at another level, like or two levels above where I was just because that's where I wanted to be. So I think learning how to push myself further was something that I learned from those earlier days as well. Do you, man, there, I have so many things to ask you as a follow up, <laughs> but yeah. let's, let me, let me, let me go, let me go this direction. Do, do you find uh, in, in terms of that idea of pushing yourself and training two levels ahead, um, for myself, um, and for other people that I've spoken with, um, off record, I feel like people who are people who have a habit of being high performers or being very driven, I feel like sometimes can push too far. Um, and that can be, uh, obviously a negative, ne- negative part of that in terms of you training and pushing yourself two steps ahead. 
did you ever find that you were pushing too far ahead or was it always kind of a good balance or how did you kind of approach that? Yeah, sure. So I know with um, jump rope, I never felt that way because I was just so in love with what I was doing. I never felt like I was, um, as we say in Australia, flogging a dead horse. Um, so even when I was really, really tired, I was really just so engaged in what I was doing. Like I, I always had a, a goal in mind of where I wanted to go in the sport. I think when you bring the goal into it, there's always something worth it in the end. No matter how tired I felt or how exhausted I was, I always felt so um, successful at the end of every training or um, if I was working at home, I always felt like I was, yeah, never just leaving empty at the end of a training session. I always felt like I was achieving something. So I think that that was... Um, kind of what stopped me from ever feeling, you know, run down or like burning out or anything like that. I never felt that way. That's interesting. And those, those days that every, every day you said you walked away feeling successful. Were there days where the skills weren't successful, but you still felt successful? Was there that like adjustment in your perception of what success was at all? Right. Yeah. I mean, I always would finish every session, um, trying to be very, I would be very, critical or constructive in a way that um I would be able to look back and and see where I didn't go so great and see where I did go um pretty good and I think freestyle for me it was almost a little bit OCD to be honest I know when I first started I had I still remember I've got the list somewhere and I would have I had 50 skills that I learned and it would have been in my like maybe first couple of months of skipping or three months. I, on weekends, I had no social life. Skipping was it for me. I was just so, I loved it so much. And I would just be in my garage and I would make myself do these skills five times each in a row on both sides. It had to be on the right side, then the left side. And if I got to like skill number 35, for example, and I made a mistake, I would have to start all the way back from skill number one and I'd have to do it again from right and left. And I just... um I don't know, became a perfectionist in that sense. Like I just always wanted to be clean. And yeah, I think from the early days, that's definitely where my, I guess my uh, freestyle technique and stuff kind of started from was really training things on both sides and um, yeah, always trying to get things without mistakes. So I guess if there was ever a stage in my jump rope journey, you know, a couple of years down the track when I would make mistakes and routines and things like that I would that was always the thing that I went back to was going back doing things on both sides making sure that I did things five times in a row without mistakes or I'd have to do it again so I've used that philosophy literally my whole uh skipping life wow that is that is a very intense philosophy <laughs> <laughs> it really is I know. yeah that you mentioned something earlier you said that and I want to I want to bring it back up because I think it's very important you mentioned that when you finish practice you look back at the things that didn't go well obviously yeah. how to, how to change those, but you also look at the things that did go well. And I feel like, um, I feel like for some people, depending on personality types and stuff, it can be kind of difficult. You know, they can sometimes have a harder time recognizing what went well. And, and that doesn't mean obviously like, Oh yeah, forget the mistakes. I'm fine. It's, but just having a very realistic perception of celebrating the things that were wins, even if they were small, did you, was that just kind of innate in you? Did you find it pretty easy to always kind of keep track of what was going well in addition to fixing things? Yeah, right. It's an interesting question. I know I was taught from a really young age to write everything down and document everything so I could, you know, keep track of, um, you know, where I was at with my freestyle skills and um, route when I was writing routines, like where I was at and how I was going with things in terms of mistakes and um, I know with my speed scores and things like that and, and training and doing all my drills and things, I would write everything down so I could, I know week by week or even day by day, I could really see where I was progressing and where I wasn't. And I know if there were things that I, if there were areas where I wasn't doing so great in, I wouldn't necessarily um, feel defeated or anything by that. I always um, used it to my advantage in a way and just found it would work out another solution to the problem um, and would try and yeah, work around that. So there was always good in um, something, even if it didn't look like it at the time. And so um, I think that was the power of really being aware of where I was at and writing things down. I could, could really analyze and 
and draw from those situations and and improve upon it. That makes a lot of sense. That's yeah. You know, it's it's always interesting, like because when I when I have people who are who are world champions on on the podcast, it's always fun to kind of back up and look at what they've done to get there. And I'm I'm curious. I mean, he, he what we've talked about so far from the very beginning really explains <laughs> why you have been so successful at competition. Um, was there anything along the way a little bit later into your jump, competitive jumping jumping career? Um, was there anything that you did later? that you changed or did you just you know keep increasing the intensity or what yeah. what do you think was kind of the the factor that that led to your ability to be such a successful world champion uh i think okay this is quite interesting um and i've actually had some time to kind of think about why as a team as well did um we get to these world competitions and always do so well. And um, I know to this day, I mean, the FISAC uh, World League just finished up in 2018 and um, World Jump Rope finished up in 2019 and, and our team has remained undefeated since I started in team skipping, which was 2002. And um, I think that I think back and living in Australia, we live so far away from the whole rest of the world. We're in our own little bubble over here. And I know, um, you know, going back like 10, 15 years, it wasn't as accessible as it is now to see videos and things like that and, and compare ourselves to what was happening out there. So every time we went to a competition um, earlier on, whether it was like 2004, 2006, 2008 Worlds and, and 2010 even, um, we didn't really know what the rest of the world was doing. And so when we walked in, all we were focused on was ourselves, our team. That's all we knew. We, um, you know, the, the European championships, they, they basically have like their own little, um, mini world championships inside another one. So, um, I don't know, maybe I think that could have been a huge advantage. I'll never really know the answer to that, but all I know is we just always went in so confident because we were just so focused on what we were doing and not what anyone else around the world was doing. Cause there was no way of us really knowing that. I, I think back now and think maybe that could have been a, a huge part of it. But all I know is that every, after every world championships, we went back like completely cleared the slate and it was like starting again. And I think we all knew that for us to get to the next level again, we just had to like, be really, really creative. We just knew we had to lift our game and, and not by comparing it to other people's scores or routines, but just like drawing from our own creative um, boards and, and really just pushing our speed to the next level. It, it all came from within us. It wasn't from what was going on around us. Yeah. So what did that, what did that process look like when you, when you finish up a competition? Yeah. It's a month, it's a month later, right? It, all the, the competition high has kind of you know, relaxed a little bit. Um, you're back in practice. What, what, are, what are the conversations? What, are, what are you doing to, to foster that creativity? Right. So the first thing we usually do is just, um, we spend a lot of time coming up with, um, new creative combinations and things like that with our freestyle skipping. And then we'll find, um, some really cool pieces of music, I know in Australia we're renowned to have these like dramatic instrumental pieces of music because they carry these yes. um, really yes. heavy accents and things where you can really accentuate the um, the skill and, and bring the skill to life as such. So we would, yeah, pick these really cool pieces of music and then from that it's almost like the music would tell us what to do. I know um, I would listen to the piece of music and then just like things would – pop into my mind about like what needs to happen here and what needs to happen here. And, um, yeah, I guess just really not trying to use anything that we used at the last competition. It was really just like, what's something new that we can do. And, um, I guess when you're in the creative process, you don't really, um, know what's going on. Things just kind of come to you. You just kind of work it out as you go. But, um, I think what we, Above all, we just really wanted something different. We never wanted to go to another competition with the same kind of material. We just had to step it out, step it up a notch one way or another. Um, but yeah, I think 
it was just, um, yeah, finding new music, uh, coming up with new combinations and, and trial and error. Trial and error was a big part of it. Like some t- sometimes we worked on things they didn't work, so we would go back and reanalyze that and then create something new and uh, until it really fit. And we we had a brilliant coach. Um, we still call her Miss Barker, and she was just the perfect person to go to when we had something new. And she would be like, "Look, I like this, but I think we need to look at this part and maybe explore another way to um, make this part look better." Um, and you can have like ten skills together in 10 different uh, sequences and one way will look really, really great and the other way won't look so great. So I think there's a a power in learning or knowing how to um, string skills together to make really fluent and creative combinations, yeah. And that that is a process of doing and of testing again and again and again. It's something you learn along the way, definitely. Mm Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense when it, when it comes to competitions, uh, first of all, and I'm going to link this up in the show notes, your routines are absolutely mind blowing. Um, it's, Thank you. it's, it's incredible, man. What, what was, uh, what was one of your, your most favorite moments from competition? Um, there's so many out there, I guess, um, every, every moment I've had where I've achieve success um in some way has has all been so different to the next so it's it's such a difficult question to answer but i would say that winning the 2018 and 2019 um team world championships with world jump rope and fisac was pretty amazing because it was the last one of each and just to kind of finish in that way with my team who were like my best friends was just absolutely amazing and i think for everyone, it was kind of like, is this going to be like, as a team, is this going to be like our, our last one? Like, we didn't really know where we were at. So um, just to go out with that bang um, was pretty amazing. And I think individually, the, so in 2010, I'd won my fourth all round um, individual world title. And 2012 didn't have um as much success i i remember i i didn't do really i got i came fourth overall that year but um it was like the first kind of loss that i experienced and i was actually just talking about this with my coach the other that's night. a long run oh my gosh yeah yeah <laughs> holy cow dude that is it's such that's a lot of years back to back to back that you were winning <laughs> yeah and um i think that 2012, like after that 2010, it was almost like I, I did lose a little bit of motivation. Like I didn't, I, I know now looking back, I needed something to really push me to go further. And so anyway, I went into 2012 and didn't have as much success and at the, at the time felt quite defeated. But I remember as soon as I got back to Australia, that next two years was just like go time. And it really gave me something to strive towards. Um, and I went to the next World Championships in 2014 and was able to get back up on the podium and break a world record in my triple unders and win my freestyle um, again. So it was it was the the dip in my career as such or like the, the part at the time that I thought was a loss or a lose was what really inspired me um to do something great again so i think i yeah it was the down part that really brought out yeah something amazing i it's it's such an interesting thing it's at the time i i really felt so defeated but um didn't realize until yeah later on that i needed those those moments in my career to really yeah do some good things so but yeah 2014 was um yeah, I was able to do some amazing things again in my career. And that's with with the trip unders, how how many did you do unbroken? So I did 511 that year and it was Florida that the two years before I did, I think I did 91. So I'm, I had a miss. That must've been so frustrating. Yeah, it was. And that's the thing with triple unders. You can be so good at them, but it's such a mental battle when you're out there on the field and 
like it's nothing but you and your own thoughts and any we all know anything can happen and um i think just going from that to then going back and winning it um and breaking a world record was just um huge for me at the time yeah that is that is such a large amount but i know what you're saying when you're yeah i've I've been at regional competitions and obviously national as well we're like (laughs) you're you're ready for a huge number at least you know you you know you can hit you've you've conditioned for for you know your personal best and you're you're really good at and consistent at getting that yeah and you miss on like 30 50 90 and you're like come on (laughs) yeah i know and it's just the worst feeling isn't it yeah because it because it's always at least i mean i don't know if you feel this way but for me when i've done that it's like there was nothing wrong it's just like my foot or my hand or like just it twitched the wrong way or something and then boom clipped right you know? yeah and so and, and sometimes you you get out there and, and just something your technique just changes it's just like the the nerves sometimes can really get the better of you but i've come up with this way that i think really helps me stay in time with my triple unders and i did this without realizing i remember in florida when because when you count triple unders you count every time the the athlete hits the floor like that's when you count one two three and so on and i noticed that in my head i was counting i always counted my triple unders when i was in the air and i never really thought much about it until afterwards either that i feel like i can hold my timing and everything so much more when i count my triple unders in the air and then I, I tried um, in a practice one day doing triple liners and counting it when I hit the floor and I just could not keep the timing. I know it sounds really strange, but I, I couldn't keep the timing as well as I could if I counted it in the air. And I remember I spoke to Tori, Tori Boggs from USA about this, and she said that it helped me so much when I counted my triple liners in the air. And I think um, looking back now to Florida, when I had somebody in my box counting me when I hit the floor and that was kind of in my mind. I feel like maybe counting on the floor was something that threw my timing off a little bit. I don't know, but that's just something that I've definitely worked out since then is that, yeah, counting in the air definitely does help with the timing. I could see that. I could definitely see that. You know, now that you say it, I think, um, yeah, I think that's such a subtle thing, but it makes a really big difference. Yeah, because I think you're counting when you're doing the wrist action. When you're in the air, that's when you're turning. So you're going like one when you're turning the rope as opposed to like pausing your arms when you're counting. Um, yeah. I, I think that to get extremely detailed with it, I would imagine like, and now you've made me want to go do triples. <laughs> um, I think if you if you count it on the way up, it's almost like internally there's this split second of like success and like that's green it, light, yes. like you did it. And yes. so then I would imagine that leads to some type of relaxation on the way down, which would help you set up properly and be ready for the next rep. And now you're like, okay, let's get to the next one versus when you hit the ground, that's that split second where the rope slows a little bit. And, and, and then if you slow a little bit too much, cause you relax then, or, you know, that's a, that's a weird, I think that's a weirder spot to do it. Yeah, this absolutely. Is interesting. I think there's some type of there's probably some type of psychology in there, but um, yeah, it's definitely something I found that has helped me along the way. So if anyone wants to try it out there, give it a go and let me know what they think. <laughs> yeah, that that's great. With with, with competing, uh, were you ever because we're talking about nerves a little bit, and and when you know that obviously creeps up in competition. How what is what has been your relationship with nervousness in yeah. competition throughout the years? Uh, so with nerves, I mean, we all, we all get nerves when we compete, but that's the first thing I try and think about when I'm competing is that everyone else is feeling the exact same way that I'm feeling. And immediately that kind of alleviates some of the nerves there. And the next thing you're going to think is the weirdest thing ever. But, um, I watched a documentary once about like the mind and, and ways to kind of like, um, I don't know, just kind of relax it. And one way was imagining that, um, everyone was a baby. <laughs> hmm. That's interesting. That's honestly, that is, I really don't think that's weird. Like that is really fascinating to me. So yeah. what, what's the, what's the context with that? Okay. So I think remembering that everyone is it well, if I picture everyone as a baby or at least try and tell myself that everyone here once was a baby, then I don't see anyone 
in the competition who was like this, this superhuman person, like they're all just human. It like brings it back to that. And so that's the first reason why I do that. And then the second, like, I, I mean, I never walk into any competition and think I'm the, like, I never go in with the mentality that I'm better than anyone. I don't think anyone does that. Like, I, I really don't. Like, I, I go in, with, like, knowing um, just exactly what I need to do. But I also go in knowing who my competition are. And they're kind of the ones where I just really try and <clears throat> tell myself that, you know, they're just human. Um, so, I mean, there's no real specific um, rituals. Like, I think to do well in anything, you've really just got to focus purely on what you're doing. Um, but, yeah, if there is anything, that's that's probably the, the only thing I do. But other than that, um, I think when you get out there and you just take that kind of first jump or that first skill in your routine, it kind of all just goes away. And um, I know... I can't remember which athlete it was, but I remember someone once saying that the best way to do a freestyle routine at a competition is just pretend that you're doing a performance. Um, so I know yep. when I do a yeah. freestyle yeah. routine now at a at a world championship event, it's I generally try and just think of it as I'm performing for the audience. Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes a lot. It's really cool to hear that. You know, I think for for someone who might be newer in the sport, or for someone who might be um, you know, observing uh, your, your success. It's very easy to, to think when, when you've got that many championship titles, when you've, when you've had that much success, Oh, that person doesn't get nervous, but, but you, but you do, everyone does. And it's still a very normal thing. You know, like I, I, that's such an important point, this humanizing everyone around you and realizing that, um, like you said, it's not, it's not about being better or worse than, or any, any kind of comparison. It's that like, we're all here doing the same thing. We're all feeling these feelings and, and working through it, which is what is so fun about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense with, with, uh, I want to go a little bit of a different direction outside of jump rope. Um, let's, let's talk about career outside of jump rope. What, um, what type of type of schooling have you done and what, what kind of I'll, I'll use the word professional a little bit loosely or professional, um, work have you done? Cause I know you're, you're currently coaching, correct? Yeah. So I currently I, I run my own company and, and, um, do things in schools and, uh, different CrossFits and, and, um, do some mindset stuff and things like that. But I originally, so I, I obviously, um, went to school, well, not obviously, but I went to school and, um, went to grade 12 and then had a year off. And that was the year that I was training for worlds, um, which was 2010. And then after that, um, went back to university and I studied like a, a marketing like type degree. And so from there kind of went down that road. Um, and I, I always liked, um, kind of, doing marketing and things like that because you could channel your creativity um, into your work and, and things like that and um, always tried thinking outside the box. So um, it was good in the way, but in the back of my mind, the whole time was just like something was always missing and I think that was being able to do what I loved the most, which was jump rope and being able to make that a career. Um, and it, it is quite difficult to make something like that your career when it's there's nothing else like it around you in your country. I guess – a few years went by when I say a few, I mean like eight years (laughs) Mm -hmm. and (laughs) nice. Yeah. And, um, it, it got to that point where I did not want to do anything else, but jump rope. And so I remember it was 20, I'm going to say, uh, seven, I'm going to say 2018. It was 2018 national. And I had, took this book with me and I, the whole way on the plane, I was just, you know, putting together this business plan. And I was just like, no, I made the decision I, in that moment that I wanted to start my own company up and really start growing the sport and making some type of impact in my country, Australia. And it was probably five months later that I set the company up. And then another three months after that, that I went full time. Um, in what I call now jump force. 
So, it, I mean, it's interesting though, because all the skills that I learned through marketing and, and that kind of thing, I was able to bring into my business. And, um, but yeah, just so fortunate. I, I, I don't look back and think that oh, I wish I'd done this earlier. I think it happened when the time was right. And yeah, as I said, there was no lost time because that, the, those skills that I learned along the way were, I'm able to use now every day. So I'm really fortunate for that, but I'm, I'm so um, grateful now that I'm, I'm doing what I love absolutely every single day and able to inspire kids all over the country um, on jump rope and yeah. So how, so how, how's that been going since you, since you went full time and has that changed at all this year? Yeah. So this year was a, a very funny one. Um, I, most of my time is spent, you know, going into different schools and running either, um, just daily incursions or, or week long programs, or it could be full term programs in lots of different schools. And when schools were closed down, it became a tricky one. But straight away, um, I, I set up like this little home studio in the garage and I just filmed stuff and um, got all my, I guess, all of my programs that I would do within schools, I got them uploaded digitally so that schools could have access to online resources. So um, I nothing really slowed down. I just tried to think of ways that I could work around what was happening and, and that I did. So um, a lot of, and, and that's the beauty of skipping, isn't it? You can do it anywhere. And so w when distance education was a thing, um, schools saw this as a huge opportunity to to use this as their um, PE programs. So it, w it was really, really good in that sense. Um, but what I missed the most was obviously that intimate contact with the students where you could really show them where they, um, where they might be going wrong or what they, what might be not working or you know, it, it, there's always something different in being there and helping them as a coach. But um, I think from what I hear about it now, schools had a lot of huge success with the the online program. So it did really work. But um, now things have really gone back to normal here. Um, not everywhere, but I know where I live, we've been quite fortunate. Things have been pretty normal since around, let's say, August. Um, and I was able to get back into schools then. So things have, yeah, kind of continued to grow. And, um, yeah, there was a big push for kids to get physically active in schools again. I think parents, I, when schools reopened, everything just went boom. Like my business almost doubled. And I think that was because parents really wanted their kids to be doing something active. How did you, because you, you, you've you mentioned that you've coached different different age group. You're talking about being in, in CrossFit gyms. You've obviously a huge amount of your work. It sounds like is through youth. Um, kind of what, what's been your experience coaching digitally for these different groups and have you, have you liked it? Have you not liked it? I know obviously there's, <laughs> it's a much different environment, but uh, how, how has that been going? Yeah. I mean, it, it is very, very different. I think, um, with, uh, sometimes it can be more challenging teaching adults. Like, Okay, adults, they, they tend to listen a little bit more, um, but, I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but um, I think, and their mindset's different. Like they, a lot of the time when they're learning, they really want to be learning. Um, and, but to rewire the, the habit that they formed, I know like I can find it quite challenging with CrossFits um, because. Because they're powering through everything. <laughs> right, that's it. And to change yeah. that can take some time. Um, and sometimes it can just be something small, but it, it can be quite challenging. Whereas with kids, especially with younger kids, they haven't formed any like habits as such yet. So you can create mm, they're um, Gumby. new ones. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're very, very different. At the same time, I find myself doing almost similar things with them, but just, I guess, changing um, different parts of their technique is something um, that I spend a lot of time on. I, we, we know that skipping is such a technical sport. Um, it's one of like those sports where probably one of the only sports where you can say like less is more. Like you, you turn the rope, let's just say you're doing a triple under. The more work you put in a triple under, the harder it's going to be. This is this is amazing to hear you say that because every every uh, client I work with, every everyone I work with, I always tell them jump rope is about putting in the least amount of effort to make right. the skill happen. It really yeah. is. I think when people understand that is when they um, 
can do some amazing things. And it, it starts from like the basics. Like I always say this when I teach kids, like it starts from the basics. If someone, uh, if I'm teaching someone like how to do a toad, like an underleg cross and they, they get the skill, like that's great. I'll never walk away from them and say like, that was p- perfect. Let's move on to the next thing. Now it's like, it's time to then perfect the technique because if they eventually want to get their, their TJ and their quad TJ and, and then like a quad TJ with an AS in it or something like that, the technique fundamentally, like it needs to be built from the early stages. Like it can't be, it's so hard to go back and, and rewire that and, and teach a new technique when they've, they've learned that their whole, you know, journey. So I think it's really important that technique is taught right from the beginning. Um, and that's something that I really try to instill in my students when I'm teaching. Yeah, that's, it's really critical because I'm sure as you, as you've seen with the people you've worked with, people, people get excited about different skills and what they think is, you know, what they think jump rope is, is usually across maybe some swings, maybe a double under, then they start to learn what it, what it can be. And all of a sudden you have this whole group of people testing out different, different freestyle skills. And like you're saying, without that foundation, there can be some very large roadblocks in the future if they're not given that information at the beginning. Absolutely. And I think, um, based on their age, um, I mean, everyone learns differently, but I've learned that so many people resonate with different things that you say, like they learn, um, in different styles. So I'll always, you can learn so much from kids and like with every school I go to, doesn't matter, uh, where I am or how old the student is. I'll always ask if there's something like if a student has had a roadblock for say three weeks, they're trying to learn this new skill. And then all of a sudden they get it. I'll always ask them, what was the, like that one piece of information? What was the thing that made it everything click for you? I will use all of that information. Like, like I have this book that I write everything down in and um, it's so powerful, like, because you know, you can use that as a coach, you can use that to teach the next person. Um, so that's something that I found is that, yeah, you can actually learn so much from, from kids and how they learn and, and even the language that you use to teach something, um, you know, certain things may not resonate with, with kids, but certain things will. So yeah, just learning all of that stuff. You, you've mentioned, um, note taking a few times and it sounds like Sounds like you track things a lot. Is that is that true? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. I think um, when we when we're in the situations, we think that we can remember all of the information, but you really don't. There's so much that you walk away and you you just you think you remember, but it's actually completely slipped your mind. Um, so I I do it for that reason. I believe in that a hundred thousand percent. Yeah, I uh, a few a few years ago, well, pro- probably four or five years ago what you just said, I had that thought of like, I I wasn't doing well with my skills. And I was like, why am I not doing well? And I was, you know, different, different things going on then. And exactly what you just said, I just wasn't paying attention. And obviously you can't remember, even though you think you can, you can. So my, my expectations and my actions were very misaligned. Yeah. So I started tracking everything I ate and every workout I did, um, every day for several years to have that data. And then it was, only in looking back and reviewing it, I was like, Oh, okay. Now I can kind of see the trends and stuff. I would, I would really like to nerd out on your notes (laughs) for a second because I am a huge note taker myself. And I really dig this subject, even though I know some people might not be into it. I think it's fascinating. What is your, what is your method of note taking? Do you use just a notebook? Do you use any apps? How do you, how do you structure your notes? Like, let's like really dig into this. Yeah. So honestly, if you looked at my notebook, you would just think, wow, he is so disorganized. (laughs) I think I'm the only one who can understand my notes. Um, but I, I've tried like doing the whole, um, the word document thing and taking notes. I'm such a notepad person. I'm so old fashioned like that, like pencil and paper. Um, and yeah, I just like lay out everything on a page and in weird orders and stuff like that. But the bottom line is just to get the information down. Um, however it is like if if I'm recording a training session, then it's, uh, I'll, you know, almost structure it in the way that the training lesson is, um, you know, playing out. But if I'm coaching a session and I need to take down like, um, some notes, then I've got like a specific notepad for that. So I'll just kind of like jot them down in, in any order. And they're just kind of like in dot point form. 
just so I can like go back and refer to it. But um, I've got like a different section for single rope skills, um, a different section for like double dutch and um, speed and things like that. So they're just like coaching kind of um, things that I've learned along the way. So if I ever get stuck with a student and there's, I don't know, just that one little bit of information missing that might be that missing link for them, then I'll go back and have a look through that section and be like, mm, let me try this. This might work because it worked with the student once before. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of how I do my note taking with that. But there, there really is no formal order in the way that I do my note taking. I just, the honestly, the only reason I write things down is just because I know that I won't, probably won't remember, remember them. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. that makes sense. And so are you, when it comes to notes, are you doing notes specifically for um, skills and coaching or does that extend out to other areas of life or does it stay just with jump rope? Yeah. So, um, everything started with, with jump rope. Like I would always, um, it would be just coaching or training or, or things like that. But I, I would do it with goals. My, all of my goals, I would write everything down. Um, and I'd have all of my goals like on my bedroom wall. And I actually, I think I started that when I first saw the jump documentary and I, I knew that that was Tori was doing. Tori was always like my biggest inspiration. I was so hoping you were going to go that direction. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, um, I mean, I've always been really goal orientated, but as soon as I knew Tori would do that, because Tori was like the, my biggest idol in the world. And she knows that we're, we're such good friends now um, that I would just put everything, like all of my goals so I could see them every morning and every night before I went to bed. Um, up on my bedroom wall and now um, I still do that with my jump rope now but I do it with like um, other goals that I want in life um, whether it's business goals um, relationship goals like whatever it is like any type of goal I, I write it down I think um, I learned the power of writing something down it, it's actually so powerful because I think when you write something down there's like some like a connection that you make in your body, like in your mind, you're actually like, you're physically in a way doing it. Like, you know what I mean? Rather than just thinking of it. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's, there's something in writing your goals down. Um, and then from there, I don't know, everything just kind of seems to happen in a way, obviously putting in the work, but, um, but yeah, there's definitely, um, a power in doing that. That's for sure. Have you ever had a hard time being consistent or, or a hard time putting in the work? Um, Cause you put in a lot of work, you put in a lot of work and it, and it clearly shows, was there ever a moment um, where you just seemed to, uh, for whatever reason, just not be consistent or kind of flatline a little bit, or were you always like, no, I, I know what my goal is. I know what I need to do here. Yeah, that would, that would definitely um, times where I plateaued and things like that. I always had a goal in mind though. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, like I, I didn't always move forward. Like I remember I, I hit just, for example, I had a, a personal best and a world record in my three-minute speed. That was in 2006. And in 2012, that got broken. But I probably had never topped that score that I got in 2006 until 2014 or 2015. So for like that's a big chunk of years like that's like nine years almost and like I would say that I probably peaked really early and then plateaued but it was only by having that goal in mind that whole time that probably got me to that next level again because each time I would go to the gym and I would train I would train for the goal that I had written down not for um not just anything like I, I wasn't just getting up there and skipping I always had that goal that I was working towards so I think that's what really got me past that kind of flatlining stage and got me to that next level. I, uh, I was talking to Dylan Plummer, um, on a previous podcast. We were oh, he's, chatting. He, he's, he's such a cool guy. Um, yeah. we, he, uh, he actually asked me the question and I want to, I want to ask you this question. He, he asked, um, do you think, because we see a lot of these world records right now right. being set by youth, right? Yes. Under, under 15. Yeah. Um, which is, which is interesting. Do you, do you think that the, these world records and the world records to come in the future, um, are 
however you want to phrase it, destined to be youth? Or do you think that um, they're succeeding despite the age, not because of it? Or some, some other alternative? I don't necessarily think the age has anything to do with it. However, I think it has everything to do with what they know is possible. And it's such an interesting thing. Like, these kids that are now coming, I call them kids, they're not kids, but these youth that are coming through and they're, um, they're breaking world records, they, their teammates are the ones that did it before them. And like, so they see it, it, they see these scores are actually possible. And they, they know this, like they, that there's kids I know in, in South Korea and China right now that are breaking a hundred within what their first year of skipping. Um, because they see Hold it happen every second. single day. And what? yeah. And so the Chinese in, in 30 seconds? In 30 seconds, yeah. That's and ridiculous. I actually used this experiment. Um, it was last year with I had these two new athletes come on board and they couldn't do it even a crossover when they first started skipping. And I remember I sat there, we were about to start our first speed training, and I didn't want them. I, I, I thought to themselves, if I give them an idea of what's possible and what's realistic for them now, I wonder where they would be at in like another 10 weeks. And so I was sitting there with another coach, um, like a, a good friend of mine, and I said, okay, guys, like a, around um, your age right now, it would be realistic uh, to, you know, hit around 90, 95. And I know it sounded so ridiculous. I remember um, Belle, the other coach that was with me, looked at me and she's like, Luke, do you mean like in one minute? And I was like, no, I'm just, I'm just trying something. Just, just, I'll explain later. Just roll with it. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, it was so interesting. Like the first time they went up, like it would be what you would expect to see from someone who's just started speed for the first time. I'm not kidding. On the ninth week, um, one of my students got 87 in 30 second speed with a, a like a cable coated thick wire rope. 87 from I think the first week was 50 something it was in their ninth week and um I the experiment worked because it, it just shows when the student believes that they can get a certain score and this is normal it's like what anyone else would be getting because they were kind of like in a bubble they didn't know what was possible outside of this room um okay so I feel- so I would I would really like to spend a, a minute give it, dig into as much detail as you're willing to, to give with this, because it sounds like you, you've had a lot of very hands-on experience coaching these very successful young athletes. And I really, this has been something that has been on my mind for like over a year because I've, my, my network up to this point has not been that close with the details of what these teams are doing. So I would really love to know, like, were those, were those workouts, special or unique was it just mindset what are basically all of the variables that you think had 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 a had a role in in those kids achieving such success so quickly firstly i mean they didn't really know what they were in for they were just like everything that i told them was just kind of how it they just believed it so when i told and how them old were they they are 11 they might have been oh, 10 at the time man. but they're 11 yeah um I know it, it just blows me away. Um, but I think, yeah, we just started with beaded rope exercises. Like that, that was speed training sessions. So we did a lot of beaded rope work to help with their technique to begin with. Um, we, I never let them go to like a normal everyday speed rope, like the stainless steel wire, um, just because I feel like before you go to that, you need some type of control. So I, I always start them with like a, a cable, um, like a coded wire rope. And, um, and, and just, sorry to, to provide a little bit of context again, just so that I, that I have it clear. Um, these are 11, give or take a few years around 11 years old kids that have not done speed training before are not competitive jump ropers are just learning the, the fundamentals of everything. Yeah. And in nine weeks, you've brought them up to an, a score of 87 and 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And we were only doing, wow. uh, one two maximum but most of the time it was just one training session a week yeah <laughs> that's a, that literally like i think you just broke my brain for a second there yeah wow. it, it, it broke mine too and i think that when i 
when I really sat down and analysed why are these kids so fast? Are, like, where did these people come from that are now breaking these world records? And how is yeah. it not just one person coming up and getting like, you know, 110? It's like every person from that team is doing it. How is this possible? And it makes you think like when you see it every day, you, you almost just become that, like you just do it. Um, how does anyone get faster? Do you know what I mean? Like there's got to be that, of that person that like sets the bar. Like I know that for me, that was Tori. She, she would, um, I remember when she first got 480, I think I was still getting like uh, 430 or something like that. And when she got 480, it was like three weeks later that I got over 480 because I knew, I then knew it was possible. Yeah. I think when people like a score's done, you see like everyone kind of moves towards it. Everyone goes to that next level, but someone's always got to do it first. It's always, you know, whether it's you or it's someone else, somebody somebody does that and then everyone kind of moves with it. And I think just, yeah, looking back, that was a big part of why I think, you know, these particular teams are just getting faster and faster. Which teams are you, are you referring to? Well, there's a um, there's a couple of teams from China that are just renowned for their speed, like absolutely phenomenal. And I, it was in 2016, the Chinese coach said to me that we have a, like from a, when a kid starts, in our team, within one year, they will break a hundred. Like it's guaranteed. And um, wow! But I mean, if you go in and you know that everyone in your team is getting over a hundred, like the chances of you doing it also is quite high because you know it's possible. If everyone, if you, if you couldn't see that happening, like if you didn't see that happening, I feel like the chances are quite slim. So I guess the picture I was painting for my athletes that I was coaching was that this is possible and this is possible from the early stages. Like this is how a, a score that someone would get within their first 10 weeks of skipping. So when they knew that it just changed everything. That is, that is very, very interesting. And so you said one to two times a week. So what, what did those, what did those training sessions look like? I, I would imagine they had to be pretty intense or, or was it, was it really, do you feel like it was really just the mindset is what unlocked it? Yeah. I really do believe the um, majority of it was the mindset. The training sessions were still um, like effective. We we just focused a lot on um, ten seconds and and make no mistake. It was more a technique thing too. But probably twenty minutes would be technical training, and the the next twenty would be um, like ten seconds, twenty seconds, and thirty seconds training. And then after that, we would go and do our freestyle thing. But there wasn't. Um, I guess it goes back to that philosophy that it's not what you do. Oh, sorry, not how much you do, it's what you do in your training. Um, but I think for them, it was just, it, a lot of it was the mindset. I think that came down to seeing some great scores. And not, I mean, not everyone came in and got 87 on that ninth week, but they were, I would say in their ninth week, there was still, there was 100% improvement in every everyone in that room, yeah. When it comes to speed training, what what do you find to be like the one to three most effective either workouts, sets, reps, rope style, whatever, or or methods of training? So for 30 seconds, it's completely different to three minutes. I find that going from a beaded rope to a, and a rope in between, whether it's like a short freestyle rope and then going down to my wire rope is a good way of doing it. Um, one, because you're, you're really getting your muscles warm when you start with the beaded rope and you're uh, in a training session, you're building up that strength. Then I find it quite difficult to go from a beaded rope straight to a wire rope. Um, so I like to kind of transition with that rope in between. Um, by the time. So I you, are you, are you talking about doing um, like a few sets of 30 second speed with beaded and then another few sets with PVC and then another few sets with, with wire? Right. I got you. So um, yeah, depending on the training session, um, the warm-ups are usually different, but just say let's, um, we're, um, we're doing some three minute speed training or something like that. We'll do like a 80%, um, speed rate, uh, doing a three minute with beaded rope, then maybe 90% with, uh, like a coded wire rope. So like that's 90% of like your, I guess, full out pace. And then after that, we would break the three minute speed event down and we would do like um, minute 30 drills. Um, we always break down our speed events. Like for the 30 seconds, it would be breaking it down into like 
10 seconds. We, we always need to know our marks, like where we are at 10 seconds, where we are at 20, same with three minutes. So we would um, work towards our goal, but add on 10, add on 10% of that score. So if our goal was say 500 for three minutes speed, that would be 250, but then we would always add on 10 to that. So we would always add on, um, yeah, make it 260. So that would be our goal for a minute 30. And we would do like four of those. So the first one, once again, with our wire rope, we would start with like 80% because we kind of want to work into it and get the feel for our speed rope. Then the next one would be 85. Um, the third one would be 90%. And then based on our scores from the 90% one, we go up in groups. It's almost like a little challenge. So we would have like, I don't know, say four people going up who are in like the 230 to 240 group for their minute 30 and then, and so on. So, um, and that would be our full out one. And we would, they would, that would be the score that we would record for that training session. I think it's important to always change your training sessions up and not continue just to do the same thing over and over and over. Yeah, it needs to always be changed up. And there's there's no real wrong or right way to go about it as long as you're um, doing some type of training. I think that's important. And um, all training under the mark, but also training over the mark is important too. So for a three-minute speed, we start with our minute 30s. As we're getting further into the, the term, we would take it up to two minutes, then to two minutes 30, and then we, we never really do many three minutes before we actually have to do it. Like in warm ups and things like that, we'll do like a four minute speed and things like that. But it's never like a full out thing. Our fast ones are always just just underneath. Um, yeah, the three minute mark. That sounds like a, it sounds like a lot of, a lot of work, but it sounds very in, it's interesting. You know, a lot of I talked to Stuart a while ago. Yeah. Um, about speed, and he he said a very a very diff, different style of working out, but a similar or different style of training, but a very, uh, similar idea of not necessarily running the full event. I think we were talking about three minute and he, he mentioned his style was more based on, based on music and doing splits. So a, a predefined score, um, yeah. with no miss. Right. And so I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've done that too, but, um, he, he was just mentioning how a lot of the times like he, it's not really running the full three minute, but it's practicing those splits and structuring the workout in a way where you're not dropping down to a resting heart rate, right? Like you're still very elevated the whole time. Yes. So yeah. based on doing it that way, physiologically, you're still getting a huge, a, a really great adaptation in terms of the stimulus and being able to figure that out for three minutes. So it's very interesting to hear this uh, repeated pattern from from world champions about training these speed events. Because I think uh, for me growing up I'm on my first team uh, and, to, and to, on the second one as well, like speed training was very much, um, just do the event. Yeah. And yeah. there wasn't much of a, uh, different structure to that, uh, aside from like doing a ladder, right? Like up to one fifteen and back down. Right. But, yeah. Um, yeah, this is, this is very, that makes a lot of sense. And it's very interesting to hear that the environment is playing such a huge role on the mindset. Yeah. Luke, this has been, oh my gosh, this is, this is such a great conversation. We're like already an hour deep. We could literally keep, I'm sure we could keep going for Absolutely literally great. days. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to kind of work towards, towards wrapping up here. I want to ask you, um, the, the main question of the podcast, the, the last one that I, I always put at the end, which is, uh, it, it's a big one. It's what is jump rope to you? I mean, jump rope for me, it's, it is like my life force. Like it's, it's, I live and breathe it. I, I couldn't imagine a life without it, which is. I'm sure why I found it. It's been that vehicle that has allowed me to not just be successful in the sport, but be successful in life and, and being able to grow and continue to grow and um, introduce it to people in the way that I saw it and, and being able to inspire kids all over the country to get fit and active with the rope and and not just do it as a, as a competitive thing, but as something, I mean, they can choose what level they want to participate in the sport at, but just... Um, that's like, it's just been consumed my life in the best way possible. And, and, um, there's no other words for it. It's just literally is my life force. It's, it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's what, um, yeah, it's everything. It's the only thing that I ever want to do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, you know, I remember being whatever, 11, 12, 13 years old and, and thinking like, man, 
if I could, if I could do jump rope as a job, I'd be set. But and at the time, I don't think at that time, I don't think there was anyone really, really like doing it. Right. Um, and, and so I didn't think that that was possible. And now here we are today and there's folks like you, folks like Nick and Kaylee and, and a lot of people across the globe that are doing it. And I think that that is, uh, so amazing that it's actually a possibility now. Luke, thank you so much for being on. This has been, oh man, this has just been so good to 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 get really dig deep in all these subjects and to hear some more about. Uh, it's just it's really fun talking to you. You're a massively successful world champion, so it's been really cool to kind of uh, dig into your history with everything and, and your training and and all of that. No, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was it was great to chat and and to dive um, deep into these subjects. So I think. Even for myself, when I um, when I dive into these um, subjects, it really kind of brings up so much stuff that I, you know, don't necessarily think about on a daily basis. So it's it's, it's really cool to do. So thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'll let you let you get back to the rest of your day. But this is yeah, we'll we'll have you on again for a part two. That's definitely going to have to happen. I would love to be back. Alrighty. Well, thanks, Nate. Hey, real quick, before you leave, hold on, hold on a second. It would really, really be helpful to me and to the sport of jump rope at large. I know, big goal, right? It'd be really helpful if you sent this podcast to somebody else. And I know that that, that whatever, Nick and Nate, stop annoying me. This, I already listened to the podcast. I'm good. No, no, but listen, if you send it to somebody, I'm getting crazy here. If you send this um, to somebody, it really does help get the word out about jump rope. It helps people get this information. It helps people learn all of the things that you just heard. So I would really really appreciate it if you could send this to somebody all right that is it that's my little hyper and brand <laughs> i hope you have a great rest of your day night lunch dinner wherever you are in the world all right see ya